Yep. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to MSJ. Um, this time we are hosting Dr. Shadrak Mutuku, who's currently a postdoc research fellow within Molecular Horizon at the University of. <laughs> I'm going to butcher this. Uh, is it Wollongong? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, spot on. Yeah. Yeah. He completed a, doc a, a DPhil in Australia at the University of Adelaide. It's Adelaide, right? That's in 2020. His research focused on spatial mapping of lipid uh, profiles of clinical prostate tissues by using MALDI MSI. And this was to identify markers of tumor aggressiveness and androgen receptor uh, targeted treatment response, as well as by analytical characterization and visualization of um, enzalutamide uptake in a patient-derived tissue culture model of prostate cancer. His PhD thesis was highly regarded, and this resulted in the award of a dean's commendation for doctoral thesis excellence. And prior to this, uh, Dr. Shadrach attended the University of Nottingham, and this is in England, where he pursued the master's degree in drug discovery and pharmaceutical sciences. Here, his dissertation was uh, was on using an immob immobilized artificial artificial membrane as a phospholipid bilayer model to study its effect on drug receptor kinetics. He also holds a first class uh, BSc degree in biochemistry and molecular biology, and this is from the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. Over to you, Shadrach. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth um, and uh, Nehemiah. Uh, it's a great opportunity for um, for me to come to my science journey to share um, my experiences um, in research and in science. Uh, my name is uh, Shadrak Mutuku. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Wollongong in Australia. So uh, to kick this talk off, um, I work as a postdoc at the University of Wollongong. Um, and Wollongong, as you can see on this map here, is located in the state of New South Wales um, in Australia, uh, this red dot there. And prior to that, I did my PhD at the University of Adelaide. I work in this gray building, uh, termed as the Molecular Horizons Institute. And here, my current research is pressed as a postdoc fellow, um, include using uh, mass spectrometry imaging to study uh, the biological composition of tissues and cells, and also to understand underlying uh, processes in disease biology. So essentially, mass spectrometry imaging um, is a special tool to look at the lipids and metabolic composition and processes in a number of, um, of conditions. And primarily, I'm using mass spectrometry imaging to understand neurodegeneration in Parkinson's disease, as well as other solid tumors such as prostate and pancreatic cancer. I'm going to be talking about uh, my current research more towards the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, prior to uh, doing a PhD, uh, I went to the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom. And here I was based in the schools of pharmacy and life sciences. And this was a one year taught course program. And the skills I uh, obtained from this course included pharmacology, uh, drug metabolism, and molecular modeling using um, state of the art software. And I also learned how to look at uh, patent evaluation and other types of uh, intellectual property um, due diligence as well as uh, getting a hand in quantitative structure activity relationships. Uh, basically, this is looking at the uh, molecular and physical chemical properties of a compound and see how it impacts its physiological action on its bound to receptor. So basically, the degree was, uh, you know, now learning um, drug discovery from uh, the you know early discovery phase uh, lead generation up to um, clinical trial and post marketing surveillance um, and for my final uh, uh, term i did a dissertation and the project was uh, using an immobilized artificial membrane to look at how the phospholipid membrane determines drug receptor kinetics 
and I primarily uh, used a technique known as high performance liquid chromatography. And basically here, what I was doing um, is look at the elution profile of a series of compounds and generating their hydrophobic city index and relating that to the uh, receptor uh, parameter, uh, the pharmacodynamic parameters of those compounds. Um, I also hold a doctor of philosophy degree. Um, after uh, finishing off my master's in the UK, um, I came to Australia to do a doctor of philosophy degree um, in the year 2020. And here I was in the University of Adelaide uh, within the Adelaide Health and Medical Sciences Division. And my project was housed in this uh, fancy uh, building, which sort of looks like a cheese grater, the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute. And this was a four year research program that I completed um, in, uh, in 2020. And uh, the main fields of research uh, for this program were cancer cell biology and solid tumors. And I was looking at these two fields of research using a technique known as mass spectrometry, which falls within the sphere of analytical chemistry. And for those who don't know what mass spectrometry is, is uh, it's a powerful technique to look at the uh, molecular size and weight of uh, compounds and you generate a mass spectrum and where the ions are detected in their form of their mass to charge ratio and you look at the intensity profile of different ions. So it's a very powerful technique for characterizing the physical and chemical properties of a number of compounds, uh, whether inorganic or organic. So I'm gonna talk about this much later on in my talk. And so uh, my area of interest was in prostate cancer research, where I looked at the uh, role of lipid metabolism, specifically how androgen receptor, a key driver of prostate tumor growth and, and, and proliferation was involved in uh, driving a disease aggression. And I used uh, mass spectrometry imaging, specifically to look at the distribution of various lipid compounds or fat molecules within um, clinical prostate uh, cancer tissues. So how did I uh, end up here? Um, well, it all began at a very early age. Um, I will say I had a very nascent uh, passion for science from very early on, um, you know, as far back as, you know, class three back in Kenya. And, you know, for science, you need to have that initial uh, passion that sparks our uh, curiosity and you need to maintain these two attributes um, you know throughout your scientific journey or um, scientific um, studies and with passion and curiosity um, you know as you know as key tenants to my um, to my studies and our professional life I've always been committed to work uh, very hard in science and uh, my scientific career began by obtaining, first of all, uh, a Bachelor of Science degree in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology uh, back in 2010 from uh, Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, uh, JQ at Karen. And uh, with this degree, I was fortunate to get an internship opportunity at the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Um, and I was based at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, in Kisumu, uh, Western Kenya, where I specifically worked in a TB research laboratory. And um, my day-to-day -day tasks included, uh, you know, doing specimen reception, uh, doing uh, genotyping assay for mycobacteriology um, samples, um, deriving culture isolates for doing drug susceptibility testing, as well as doing quality assurance and quality control. So, um, I did this for about uh, close to three and a half years from 2011 to uh, 2014. And then I sort of, you know, got got bored with the mundaneness and with the monotony of the job. Um, I felt like, you know, having a first class on us in biochemistry and molecular biology, um, I could do so much more in science and research. And I was, um, you know, intellectually up to the task. Um, so um, I had 
always this lifelong dream of uh, going to England. So I took the risk of um, of leaving my role and, and quitting my job in Camry uh, Kisumu uh, to pursue a pharmacology uh, Master of Science degree um, in uh, in Nottingham, England. So I went uh, at the end of um, of 2014, and I did this program for one year at the School of Pharmacy. Um, and so how did I uh, get this opportunity? So um, it was quite a, a tenacious and, and painstaking process to go to Nottingham. Um, but for those of you who are interested in getting an academic scholarship, uh, maybe some of you have just done your first degree in Kenya. Um, there are a number of opportunities for you to um, access your um, your target program. So generally, there are three streams of um, funding available to support um, scholars. So this can be foreign government. So for example, uh, the United States or Australian government could be offering a scheme uh, that you know applies to most Commonwealth countries. And then you can also have your academic institution. If your specific university offers um, uh, scholarships for various types of programs and fields and disciplines. Or you could have a philanthropic body, let's say, for example, um, Cancer Research UK or Cancer Council Australia, or let's say uh, American Cancer Society that are offering um, uh, specific types of scholarship. And then this accessible both at undergraduate level, which generally tends to be quite broad. So you could apply for a number of schemes. This could be like the roads of Chevening scholarships, for instance, offered in the UK. And this um, accessible to people who have just done their first degree um, or rather they've just done their high school studies and they want to get um, into their first degree. So these scholarships do exist. Uh, they are mind you for quite um, talented and exceptional uh, uh, students. Uh, for more like masters and postgraduate, uh, you know, PhD level uh, programs, either by coursework or research, you do have um, the academic institution offering faculty based scholarships, uh, which you can apply for, or you can have like uh, within a specific university, um, a scholarship offered by a specific research institute, or our, our center. So, for example, in Australia, you do get sat, um, within the Australia Research Council, which is the federal body that offers uh, funding to uh, research scholars in Australia. You know, having a very targeted call for research. Let's say, um, you know, looking at specific type of receptor. Let's say, in you know, any cancer or any uh, disease you can think of. So, they are generally like centers of excellence across uh, multiple. Um, uh, research or disease areas of interest that offer these types of scholarships. So how is my um, application um, process like for um, admission and scholarship? So um, having uh, you know, the interest and lifelong dream of going to the United Kingdom to pursue um, you know, uh, further studies, um, I was drawn to a number of institutes such as the University of Oxford, and yes, specifically, I was interested in the Rhodes Scholarship and Chevening Scholarships. Um, however, these are very quite competitive and they require, you know, top of the top um, de la cream um, qualified candidates. So I couldn't get either of these, you know, despite having you no know, first class honors in biochemistry, um, um, uh, you know, from Kenya. But I did get admission to the University of Oxford but I couldn't take up the opportunity due to lack of funding. So, uh, you know, and you're right, this is my admission letter to Oxford where I was successful, um, you know, to get into pharmacology in 2013. And this is also an admission letter from St. Catherine's College. Um, but I had to forgo this opportunity. Um, uh, and then I, you know, sort of, you know, I'm not going to give up on my dream. Let me look at another university in UK, maybe not as prestigious as Nottingham, as, as Oxford, but you know, I went for still a decent university uh, in the name of Nottingham. 
And here I was successful in obtaining the Developing Solutions Master Scholarship, which was targeted to people from uh, low to middle income countries who wanted to pursue further studies. And I was fortunate to get like a 50% tuition fee. And so um, I went to the UK uh, later on in 2014, um, but I had to defer my uh, to define my offer by a year because um, I had a I made a rookie mistake of uh, not applying for scholarship funding when I was applying for the admission. So the processes of applying for uh, admission to a specific course program are often decoupled from applying for scholarship. So I had admission in 2013 still uh, for Nottingham as well as Oxford but I had to defer my Nottingham opportunity because I didn't have funding. So later on uh, in 2014, I was fortunate to go to uh, University of Nottingham to do my Master of Science um, in Drug Discovery. So one essential ingredient uh, for a Master of Science or a you know, Doctor of Philosophy program um, is a statement of purpose. And this is usually a personal and professional justification of why you're suited to a particular program or why you're so suited to join a particular faculty to pursue um, a certain course or the course of your choice. And usually um, this is one to two pages long and it can be anywhere between 500 to 1000 words approximately. And on your right is uh, my statement of purpose uh, for admission to the University of Oxford. Um, the key take home messages here is that it has to be um, authentic. You have to communicate, you know, a genuine desire to pursue a specific, um, you know, scientific question or program. And you also have to, uh, your passion and your, your commitment to the science has to uh, come through, uh, you know, your personal statement. And remember to keep this quite brief. Uh, one page is quite decent. Uh, given that, you know, admissions office and, you know, program directors read through potentially hundreds of these applications. So the shorter you make it and straight to the point, uh, the better for you. And basically it has a couple of elements. So an introduction to yourself, about yourself, the qualifications, what you're currently doing, uh, your scientific interests, and what are your career objectives in relation to the program you're applying to? And you also have to uh, sell yourself as to why you are the most suitable candidate above anyone else to be admitted to this program, because you know universities uh, only have a limited pool of funding or positions available to offer admission, um, let alone scholarships. Uh, so. After completing uh, my Master of Science um, in, in the UK uh, at Nottingham, I wanted to further my studies. I wanted to stay in, in the UK, but I couldn't get uh, into a PhD program there. So I looked uh, further you know, down under across the globe, uh, and I looked at Australia, where they do offer a number of schemes, such as the Federal uh, Commonwealth of Australia Research Training Program Scholarships, or RTP. Um, so these ones are at a national level where the Australian government funds specific um, uh, programs across uh, all public universities in Australia, as well as university-based scholarships. So here, uh, for instance, a specific uh, university will offer a broad range of scholarships to international students. So I was fortunate enough to get admitted um, uh, under uh, uh, this scholarship uh, known as the uh, University of Adelaide International Wildlife Health Scholarship uh, to pursue my PhD studies. So basically, uh, the process of landing um, program admission and scholarship uh, sponsorship in a university is like a three stage process and where the first stage is you contact the university. So this involves writing an email to a potential supervisor where you express your genuine interest and common desire for a specific uh, scientific question or research objective. 
And then once your supervisor says, yes, I have a space in my lab, then you approach the admissions team. And for most uh, universities um, outside Kenya, they will have like an international admissions office. And here as part of your application, in the next stage, you have to draft uh, a simple research proposal that is geared and targeted to the theme of your potential supervisor's um, uh, you know, research interest. And then once you have a research proposal, this is included as part of the application to a specific course program where you fill out you know, the administrative details of uh, of uh, this particular course you're applying to, like uh, you know the application form um, and everything else. You upload your qualifications, your curriculum vitae, uh, your certificates, and other documents that show you're a genuine candidate. And then in the last stage, you wait for an outcome. So once your application is deemed successful by the International Admissions Office or uh, the faculty, you receive a letter of offer. And these letters of offer are almost always conditional. So you'll get a conditional uh, letter of offer that you have to respond to. Uh, for instance, in the UK, this is known as a, you know, confirmation of acceptance of studies or a confirmation of, of enrollment of studies. So once you meet certain conditions, um, which include the financial conditions, so pay the school fees uh, or supply certified original documents. Uh, this will include your transcripts and uh, your undergraduate parchment, like you physically uh, send over a certified copy over to the university from your uh, previous institution. Then you'll get your confirmation of enrollment or confirmation of acceptance of studies. Um, and then this is um, usually a unique number or identifier that's sent to the to the immigration department of the country. And once you have this uh, uh, confirmation, uh, you can apply for a visa. Once you've applied for a visa, then uh, you meet all the other conditions, then you have a green light to take up your program. Um, so once you take up a program, you will um, uh, early on realize you need guidance. And this is where mentorship comes to play. Uh, so who is a mentor? So a mentor is a more experienced uh, professional that guides um, you as a junior scientist or researcher in your professional and career development. So often these are world experts or um, you know renowned people in a specific uh, field of of research or, or area of expertise. And often in Australia and the United Kingdom. Uh, they take the form of your PhD supervisor in your university academic research setting. Um, and in the US and uh, a larger mainland Europe, uh, the PhD supervisor is sometimes referred to as an academic advisor. But you can also find um, a mentor outside um, your PhD supervision panel. So this can be a professional you meet up in a mentorship program. So usually most university offer programs for, uh, you know, science, technology and engineering and mathematics or STEM fields. So the university will have like a competitive process of uh, having student, students uh, apply or register interest for, um, for being linked to an industry or expert in the field of STEM. So this will be someone outside the university uh, where you meet up on a regular basis. Um, even uh, as uh, early postdocs, there are a number of early career research networking opportunities that offer uh, mentorship support within the wider university outside your line manager or supervisor. Uh, one key thing is I've come to appreciate is that supervisors can have a profound impact on your future career trajectory. Um, and having you know, gone through a PhD process, I've come to appreciate my supervisors because they um, often do know other people that they can network or link you with for your next career step. So um, if you're an expert, let's say, you know, in, you know, genomic sequencing and you, uh, you, you know, you have published a couple of papers and you've done and submitted a PhD 
this is successfully at a university, your supervisor can recommend for you a specific uh, person within that area um, if you want to continue in academia to to join their lab. So they are very they have a very strong impact in you know first of all pointing you in the right direction of approaching other potential um, uh, line managers in your career um, as well as you know giving you a very um, supportive uh, uh, you know letter of reference for your next job application. So you you want to have uh, them in your corner. So it is quite important, um, you know, now to highlight the importance of these uh, research relationships. Um, often research is quite a small world. In my case, um, working in the field of mass spectrometry imaging, this is a very technical and specialized field. And in the bottom right here, you can see me with a with a picture of my supervisor panel. So this was Professor Lisa Butler was an expert in cancer cell biology, and these were my two co-supervisors, Dr. Martin Snell and Dr. Paul Trim, and they were experts in um, you know, mass spectrometry. And after completing my PhD program, they were quite instrumental in helping me get my current postdoctoral fellowship. Well, well, it being a quite a small field and them having known my current line manager at the University of Wollongong. So, it is quite important to maintain this health relationship because uh, often you will meet again in conferences, often you will see uh, their names uh, come in common with your current line manager in several peer reviewed publications, either as you know an independent peer reviewer or as a co-author, they will often know your current or even future line manager. So it's quite important not to once you leave your current, uh, you know, PhD position, don't burn any bridges. Um, just keep uh, keep in touch. Uh, occasionally, share simple greeting emails and and um, also try and you know you know keep in touch and you know suggest ideas for future collaborations. And in most instances, once when you come to towards the end of your PhD program. You, you will not have published all of your papers. Um, you will have, you know, roughly, you know, two or three papers. If this will include like a, a peer review, uh, you know, a literary review, as well as an original scientific publication. But there are also other papers, you know, your last, you know, PhD chapter that still needs to be uh, worked up into a paper. So you will need to maintain these relationships so that you, you come out publishing um, the papers that are remaining from the rest of your PhD thesis. Um, now, in this segment, I'm going to talk about you know you know adapting to a new country. So, uh, it's almost always the case coming from a developed countries and going to a Western country um, to you know suffer some so sort of culture shock. Uh, the thing is, this is quite normal. Uh, most uh, new PhD students from Kenya going um, to to UK or Australia do suffer from some form of culture shock. Uh, shock, and this is just some some sort of strange, you know, you know, sudden disengagement from your usual settings, and you mostly miss your family, friends, and 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 food. Um, but you know, it takes time to adjust, uh, and you can cope by you know. Let's say, for instance, in my case, you know, when, when I was finishing my uh, my PhD uh, or rather my master's program in the UK, you know, I read on, you know, how is Australian culture like uh, and even going before going to do my uh, master's in the UK, I had a familiarity of how the culture in the United Kingdom is. So there are some common elements, you know, having, you know, undergone a very similar system of education to Britain, where you know there are some uh, common um, thing things you will find. But when you get to a new country, it's important to you know you know make new friends, um, and then you also find that the cultures are quite different, uh, either in terms of religion or you know political um, leanings or political ideology. So it's quite important to just. Um, Acknowledge they are what they are and just respect them. Um, and also try to enjoy your new surroundings. 
uh, you know, you could, you know, go to the local central business district, uh, you know, do some shopping, get familiar with the bus routes. And also occasionally during your, you know, mid semester break or mid term break in between your exam, uh, take some time off to explore your new country. So it, the first semester is, is always hard. Um, I, I'm not going to lie to you, uh, but there are various strategies which you can cope. And I'm going to get into this in detail. So for instance, when I went to the University of Nottingham, uh, you know, back in 2013, uh, 2014, uh, in the first week, um, I, I arrived sort of late and I missed a few uh, welcome events um, during uh, the first week. So most universities will have a whole week of welcoming students to campus. So it's very important to attend the welcome events. Uh, and as soon as you get there, it's important to set up an appointment with uh, an officer within the international uh, students office. And here they offer a range of support. So it could be, you know, helping you settle into accommodation or trying to look for more permanent and suitable accommodation. And they can even suggest options for affordable accommodation. Uh, and this is always uh, important in case you don't have like a full scholarship or you're you know partly paying your school fees like in my case um, it was quite important to find like affordable accommodation and then um, also important to uh, meet your local school administrator and here they will give you specific guidelines to your uh, school where uh, they will offer you um, you know dates and a program of induction for your specific school so for for me I went to my you know school of pharmacy and school of life sciences and they you know gave me a handout for attending you know specific induction events where I met my program director for my MSc course and also it's importantly during this first week you know is to get plenty of rest uh, go outside and and get plenty of sunshine um, just to adjust to the weather and the different time zones. And then in your second week, once you are you know, rested, you can familiarize yourself with the local surroundings. So this could be things like the local shopping center. And here, you know, you can go looking for, you know, familiar foods. So in UK and Australia, you can get a number of, you know, African and Indian shops, which offer very familiar you know, foods and spices to Kenyan food. So you can, you know, get things that can, you know, maize meal to help you cook ugali and, you know, flour to make you, help you cook chapati. So you can find this, um, you know, local, uh, you know, exploring these local surroundings quite uh, relaxing. And also familiarize yourself with other key support resources. Uh, for example, the student union, uh, they will offer advice on how to, you know, get emotional and um, and mental health support, and also, you know, you know, get familiar with, you know, where you can access medical help in case you fall ill during your program. So it's important to, um, you know, talk to the students' union or talk to your school, and they will offer uh, these types of uh, resources. And then, uh, you know, once you're like towards the end of your, you know, second week, you can sign up to a number of student associations. So, for instance, you can, you know, sign up to like the East African, you know, Student Association of, you know, University of Oxford or University of Nottingham. So you often find people from a back from home, Kenya or East Africa, and they can um, be very useful um, acquaintances and friends and give you that sense of, familiarity to help you uh, cope and settle into your program. Uh, and once you have really settled, uh, then, you know, your mind will be in a state where it can, you know, tackle uh, the, the intellectual demands of your new course. Um, often uh, it can be a steep learning curve, you know, the switch from, you know, Bachelor of Science in Kenya to a Master of Science in the UK, there are quite some stark differences in terms of how people do writing, how people do reading, how, you know, how to use library resources. So there was a steep learning curve uh, and this was uh, mostly in relation to, um, you know, uh, taking up very new and advanced technologies to study my program. 
And lastly, it's also important to call your family and friends back home. Uh, they can always offer you encouragement and the support you need. Uh, so working in academia, uh, in my case, it's a, it's a very uh, interesting day-to-day -day process. Um, so as a postdoctoral fellow, um, I often find myself doing um, a lot of laboratory work and also analyzing data from this laboratory work. And in between this, I have to uh, juggle and find time to do scientific writing. And this always uh, takes the form of either writing original research articles or book chapters, and also um, applying for grant funding. So writing grants and writing papers does take quite a lot of time um, as a research fellow. Uh, and so my job uh, involves um, this uh, for elements. Um, and one uh, thing you'll notice in academia and nowadays, it's not always um, a fixed, it's not always a permanent job. They are usually uh, fixed term contracts. So you have to, um, you know, keep churning these wheels uh, and, you know, come up with many papers and re research proposals as possible and apply for funding to keep yourself uh, within the, uh, you know, academic um, setting within the university. So if you're new in academia, uh, either you have taken up a new postgraduate research course or PhD uh, program, or you have taken up a new postdoctoral fellowship, um, one helpful suggestion I will have um, is to do a literature review uh, in your area. And you can quickly get an understanding of your scientific discipline by looking at literature papers. Uh, these are just summaries of the current state of uh, of things in your area and attend conferences early on. Um, I would encourage you to go to like a local uh, and by local, I mean like um, a national conference uh, within your area of research early on in your PhD, uh, in your first year. Here you can get ideas on how to do experiments, how to um, tackle uh, difficult uh, method development questions um, in your project. And the other tip is to prioritize your work and time. And what I've learned is um, what is always important is not necessarily urgent and vice versa. So uh, your priorities could be different from that of your line manager or supervisor. So um, try you'll sort of get this uh, more as you progress in the role. So try and discern what is important one and what is urgent in terms of your tasks and daily duties. Uh, and for as your you know day-to-day -day research responsibilities are try to segment tasks. So for instance, I have a five day work week. I try to do lab work three days and have like a cool off day where I just do something uh, more easy at my desk. This will involve like um, analyzing data that I've generated earlier on in the week. Uh, so I segment my tasks into, you know, lab work, few days of lab work, two or three days, a day of data analysis, and also a day of working from home, uh, WFH, uh, which is important to give you that focus and space um, to concentrate uh, on, uh, uh, on your research project. Also, it's very important to schedule regular meetings. Um, so if you work as a junior postdoc or as an early career researcher within your uh, faculty or school, uh, you'll often have uh, regular laboratory team meetings, but it's also have to have proactive meetings with your group leader or supervisor to keep abreast with your research project and to make sure everything um, is on track. Um, and so how do you stay in the game. So um, having worked in mass spectrometry imaging and, you know, having have a, a background um, in a molecular biology and biochemistry, I've come to appreciate the value of learning new skills. And often when you do a PhD, you'll always um, need to um, to learn a new skill. It's, it's very amorphous. You'll have to bring in new skills or ideas 
to answer research questions in your project, uh, to answer, uh, you know, test your hypotheses. So um, you can stay in the game in your PhD or in your postdoc by, you know, doing different types of experiments and you can get these ideas by looking at papers, uh, trying to get new uh, methods. And it's also important to like learn new skills. So for instance, um, I, you know, I sort of have to learn like some bioinformatics skills because mass spectrometry imaging generates a high volume of data. And so learn new skills to analyze your data or uh, new computational tools or softwares to um, to tackle um, your problems in your project. And so it's also important to collaborate locally and externally. And here, here's where you, you know, you can form collaborative relationships with your new experts. So this can be uh, within your field or in a related field. So you will um, need to um, form multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, research uh, cooperative projects with people uh, or researchers within you know, either the same state or country or even international collaborators. And often you, the key to creating this relationship or network is by attending conferences. And often in my experience, when you read a paper and you have this uh, idea or, uh, you know, you want to follow up on a specific uh, uh, question in relation to your project is you can always write an email to the author of a paper and uh, half the time they are, you know, quick to uh, respond or they will, uh, you know, get back to you. And also it's, you know, very important to balance your workload. Um, I try to focus on only a couple of projects at a time. Um, as a postdoc, uh, I, I, I don't only work on a specific research project. So I work in, you know, in Parkinson's disease. I work in, uh, you know, pancreatic cancer. And I do a number of imaging projects, which, you know, Am I not only looking at um, a specific type of biomolecule? I'm also looking at other types of um, compounds of interest. So, uh, and all these require like different techniques and instruments. So, so I try to balance my workload looking at two to three projects um, in the in the short to medium term. Um, outside the lab, it's very important to rest up and maintain a healthy life work balance. Um, I didn't mention this at the beginning of my talk. Uh, I have a young family, uh, recently married and with a young daughter. So it's also important to have some quality uh, family time, have hobbies outside the lab. This could be things like exercising, uh, you know, listening to music, uh, socializing with friends um, outside your workplace. So it's very important to have an all wanted work life balance. Um, I always say you have to be to rest to be at your best. So uh, switching on gears, I'm going to now focus or talk about uh, my current area of research, which is mass spectrometry imaging. So mass spectrometry, um, like I mentioned earlier, is an analytical technique that looks at the shape size um, and weight of molecules. And these molecules need to be an ionized form. So I use a technique known as uh, matrix assisted laser desorption ionization, MALDI. So in MALDI, you have a laser that is fired upon a biological tissue section that is coated with a matrix. So the matrix is a small molecule organic acid that absorbs ultraviolet laser radiation energy and it's interstitiously uh, thermalized and ablated. And in the process, it donates um, either protons or abst abstracts a proton uh, to the analyze in your tissue, uh, where you form uh, charged molecular ions. Uh, in this case, I'm showing you here uh, uh, positively charged molecular ions or cut ions, as well as matrix ions. And then these are detected in the gas phase by a mass spectrometer, where using uh, ion transmission optics, uh, the um, positively charged particles are, are guided in an electric field and they're detected by a mass analyzer, which gives you the mass to charge of your compounds of interest. 
So there are various uh, forms of mild mass spectrometry imaging. Uh, this may be a bit complex to some of you, and I primarily use two techniques where one is reflection MALDI, where you have a laser that is fired upon uh, a glass slide with a tissue section, and this laser comes anywhere between like a zero to 90 degree angle, and it fires at the front of the samples, uh, generating ions that get detected by a mass analyzer. And the second technique uh, is known as laser post ionization, where you have a primary laser beam that comes at an angle and orthogonal to this primary laser beam is you have a post ionization laser, which is also another ultraviolet laser uh, of a different wavelength that intersects with, uh, with the expanding plume of ions that are generated at the surface. So what are the applications of mass spectrometry imaging? So mass spectrometry imaging is widely used in biomedical research. So um, it has wide applications uh, ranging from cells, uh, organoids, organs, whole body sections, uh, such as rat or mice, as well as formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue sections. And here, generally, the workflow involves, um, you know, harvesting the samples and putting them on a flat surface, and again applying the matrix, which is a, uh, you know, a small molecule, acidic or basic substance that helps with uh, ionization of your analytes within the tissue. And one uh, advantage of mass spec is that it is label free where um, you don't need to uh, fluorescently to have a fluorescent probe or label on your analytes. And with mass spectrometry imaging, you retain the spatial information. So at each position, uh, you fire the laser, you generate a mass spectrum. And when you sum up this mass spectrum across uh, the flat surface of your biological tissue, you can look at the distribution of various compounds or uh, endogenous molecules such as fats, lipids, or proteins. So mass spectrometry is quite versatile and it can uh, used in a targeted or untargeted manner. So targeted means you can look at specific things such as drugs or pesticides or other exogenous molecules within a tissue or untargeted where you can profile um, hundreds of you know different metabolites uh, within um, a cell or tissue and in the end generate these molecular images that help you to understand uh, the distribution of specific analytes in relation to specific cells or types of of, um, of of tissue within your sample. So um, mass spectrometry um, is quite an attractive field uh, when it comes to lipid imaging. So going beyond the central dogma of biology where you have a DNA sequence or, um, or, a, or a genetic sequence where you receive instructions to translate uh, the genetic code into a uh, messenger RNA and then RNA into a protein. So this has been uh, the norm for most of the publications uh, in literature dating back to the early 90s where um, ever since the Human Genome Project, uh, scientists have published uh, thousands of articles in genomics, proteomics and glycomics, but lipidomics is quite catching up. Uh, together with these other omics technologies. And the reason is, is lipids give you a more accurate readout of what is happening within the cell. So when you have a specific cell or tissue uh, where you have chromosomes that get, um, you know, you have your DNA sequence that gives you the, the transcriptomics information where, uh, and then from that DNA sequence, you get proteomics, uh, from the protein, and uh, these proteins are always um, expressed through enzymes, and this enzyme catalyzes specific molecular processes within uh, the cell. And 
a key sphere of these processes include lipid metabolism. So lipids can give you quite an accurate read out of what is happening at the protein and uh, RNA level. Hence, uh, why it's becoming a very attractive area to study with the mass spectrometry. Um, and lipids uh, come in in all shapes and sizes. So there are eight categories of lipids according to the lipid maps database, where you have basically this uh, fatty acid uh, a backbone that can be linked to a glycerol uh, group. And then that is linked to a head group. And this gives you, for instance, the phospholipids. But you have other complex types of lipids such as phingolipids, which uh, include um, N-acylated at the SN2 position of fatty acids. And then these fatty acids can either be saturated where they don't have double, bo double bonds in their, in their acyl chain length, or they can be uh, saturated where you can have one or up to an N number of double bonds. So generally, uh, lipids are quite diverse molecules and they are uh, high in their complexity and multiplicity in nature. And they're very attractive to study with mass spectrometry imaging. And therefore, with lipids um, uh, and combining that with multi mass spectrometry imaging, we can apply this to a number of uh, uh, research questions ranging from neurogeneration, where you can look at Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, respiratory illnesses uh, such as lung cancer, issues to do with digestion and reproductive system, where uh, lipids uh, you know, are essential components of either the plasma cell membrane, uh, you know, they're involved in energy storage, or they're involved in uh, cells, cell to cell uh, signaling and uh, signal trans. And so, um, switching gears a little bit, um, I've used I, I've used mass spectrometry to look at um, you know uh, drug pharmacology in this specific uh, uh, prostate cancer uh, uh, scenario, where I looked at enzalutamide uptake, which is this uh, small molecule drug you see here, uh, that is a second generation inhibitor of prostate cancer which is fueled by androgens. And this drug um, works by three ways. So it either inhibits androgen binding to the receptor uh, and also blocks the translocation of this androgen, uh, uh, androgen receptor complex to the nucleus. And it also prevents the, uh, the binding of this complex to the DNA. And so using mass spectrometry imaging in a targeted fashion, I looked at the optic of enzalutamide in uh, uh, this ex vivo culture of, um, of prostate cancer tissue, where biopsy samples were taken from patients and they were cultured in a medium. And using this time course um, experiment, I looked at the uptake of the drug uh, in a 24 hour period, where we can see at the beginning of the experiment at zero hours, you have a little of the drug in the tissue, but over time, you see the drug. Uh, being taken up um, in the tissue in form of this uh, blue uh, trace you can see here that is matched to the uh, hematoxylin and eosin pathological stain. And I also use uh, uh, liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry to look at the concentration of this drug. And so it was important to understand the specific uh, area of uh, of uptake of this drug where we traced it to epithelial cells within the prostate tissue section, where we can see that the distribution uh, is not uh, homogeneous, but it's indeed quite specifically localized to within uh, specific cells that express the androgen receptor uh, backed up by this immunostochemistry of the androgen receptor uh, 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 staining. And uh, also, during my PhD, I looked at the distribution of uh, of uh, of lipids, and here I'm showing the uh, mass spectra of lipids, where uh, this uh, blue plot corresponds to epithelial sections of prostate cancer tissue, uh, given by this uh, blue clustering, whereas the stromal tissue is depicted by this. Uh, 
uh, pink traits here. And we, you can see the differential distribution of this um, of these spectral profiles, uh, indicating indeed that the metabolic uh, processes involving lipids are hetero heterogeneous within tissue. And so we use this to understand uh, the tumor response of uh, of, uh, of 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 enzalutamide within this uh, ex vivo culture uh, of prostate tissue, where we profiled uh, clinical prostate cancer samples to reveal uh, regions of or um, or alterations that can be targeted by uh, by um, specific uh, inhibitors geared towards uh, specific aspects of lipid metabolism. So here specifically uh, to understand uh, how enzalutamide affects the lipid profile, we looked at the proliferative response uh, in these patients, and we also looked at the transcriptomic response. And again here, what we did uh, show was the androgen response is quite stimulated with response to enzalutamide. And importantly, mass spectrometry was able to show that this specific lipid phosphatidyl choline that you can see has this high uh, pink uh, color distribution within uh, control samples was indeed a downregulated following enzalutamide treatment, indicating that certain lipids are responding to enzalutamide inhibition, uh, indicating uh, a direct uh, exertion of control uh, in lipid metabolism, given that you know lipids fuel uh, prostate cancer growth uh, by stimulating uh, de novo biosynthetic processes um, involving fatty acid synthesis and fatty acid assimilation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for the organizers uh, for inviting me for this talk. Thank you so much, Shedra. Um, that was really, 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 really intense. Thank you for telling your story and the sort of work you're doing. Uh, we appreciate it a lot. Um, we sort of ran out of time, so we're going to yeah. just take a few questions. Uh, if there's anyone that has a quick question for Shedrach, uh, could you please raise your hand? I think that's easier than typing. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just ask you one question, Shedrach. Um, yeah. I, I mean, you've talked about um, the process, how you got to the places you've gone, uh, your education, the current work you're doing. Um, was there any specific um, interest in cancer research um, that like sort of made you to switch to cancer research uh, from TB. I think you mentioned you were doing TB before in Kenya, and then you switched to cancer research. Um, so was that like intentional or it just happened? And then maybe could you also let us know how you dealt with rejection? Because I, I think a lot of people, um, you know, they give up easily when when sort of like the first time they're rejected, they're like, or, or the second time or the third that third time and they're yeah. like oh this is not meant for me i'm just leaving it i'll do something else uh, i'm leaving science so like how did you deal <laughs> with that especially when you didn't get the scholarship uh, for oxford because i know a lot of people they um, that are applying abroad they usually tell me oh i've gotten admission but i haven't gotten scholarship and i, I don't want to try applying again so how did you deal with that yeah those are two questions uh, but yeah. uh, thank you uh, thanks Ruth, for the question. So uh, to answer your first question, um, when I finished my first degree from Jacob uh, Biochemistry, uh, it was quite, um, it was a very versatile degree and pharmacology was one of the subjects. Um, so I was drawn uh, to pharmacology just to, you know, the, 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 the idea that compounds, when you take them into your body, they can affect your phys physiological function within cells. That was very interesting to me. Um, so I, I didn't get uh, these opportunities um, within Camry CDC, where while I do appreciate I I, uh, I was exposed to research, uh, that was more within, um, it was more of microbiology rather than biochemistry. So I made the switch from, you know, working in a, in a public health institution that looks at epidemiological um, 
studies in in TB, and you know, um, I I sort of run out of the enthusiasm of doing this day to day task of working on uh, of running samples and patient specimens. Uh, so one thing I was not getting publications out of it, and I was not going to conferences for that. So uh, most often in in Kenyan research institutions, so technical officers or technological officers or technicians, they they are not uh, acknowledged in publications. Yet you put a lot of work. So generating the data by doing experiments, you uh, you should be um, as far as I'm concerned with um, uh, scientific writing policies in cl be included as an author. So I didn't feature in publications yet. I was actively, uh, you know, working in projects and generating uh, huge amounts of data. So if I, in the end, I didn't find that quite fulfilling and I felt I was smart and competent enough to take something more um, challenging intellectually and, and scientifically, hence I I applied to 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 pursue a pharmacology degree um, in the United Kingdom. So I looked at a number of institutes, including Oxford and um, you know and Nottingham and a few others. So I I I always wanted to pursue pharmacology rather than um, stick it out at Camry and doing you know public health. Uh, you know, stroke, uh, you know, micro microbiology. And even if I was doing that, when you come to uh, other institutes um, abroad, they have a, pharmacolog a pharmacological angle to, to these areas or an active research angle to these areas. Um, and to answer your second question of how to deal with rejection, um, well, having had a, a long-standing you know passion and curiosity in science and just this uh you know basic interest and and fascination in you know molecular processes and disease processes and how this can be influenced you know by a compound or by you know an intervention you know um i just kept going uh i kept you know, I kept applying. Uh, you just have to keep going. So if you have that passion and you still have that curiosity, uh, you will keep going um, as long as you believe in yourself. I, I believe that my qualifications were strong and my qualifications were competent. Um, and uh, the first few times you will, you will not get into those Ivy League university. Uh, you, won't, you won't get into MIT or Yale or you know, University of San Francisco, California, or Oxford, or Princeton, or University of Melbourne. I applied to, you know, a good number of those types of, uh, you know, top 1% universities. Um, but uh, the good thing is I did find uh, encouragement in, you know, getting an admission, but not getting an, a scholarship. I saw the silver lining. It meant that, yes, I am, I am competent. Yes, I'm. I am qualified. It's just that uh, there was, you know, probably another better candidate. But that doesn't make me much less of a suitable candidate. So you have to keep going and keep pushing, and eventually you will um, uh, get to that dream program. Uh, after all, you are pursuing a dream. Um, uh, it, it's more than a job. It's it's more like a dream. You are you are trying to live out. So you have to keep. Uh, going and keep pushing. Great, thank you so much. Do we have anyone that has a question for Shedra? Yeah. Yeah. The audience. Uh, yeah. Apologies for the sun setting. The sun has set here in Australia, so um, uh, the sun has set. So that's why maybe some of you can't see me. I'm happy to take further questions. All right. Nehemiah, go ahead. Yes, so uh, I wanted to ask uh, in relation to the, the past section, but I appreciate for your time, especially almost, uh, uh, not almost, but you have almost shifted my, my, my interest also to start looking into libidomics. Um, that said, uh, I wanted to ask in relation to now, uh, in the first segment where you were talking about more of how to work with the PI, how to 
continuously stay ahead. So in terms of now scheduling of meetings, um, sometimes I find this tricky. So how how often should um, should meetings be scheduled because there are very many priorities and often the peers are always looking at the end result uh what is the result saying but you find you are at the mental stage or you are at the uh, scripting stage where you are you have to choose which tool to use when or uh which one not to use so how how often and how regular should meetings be scheduled uh, thanks for that question, Amaya. Um, from experience as a PhD student, um, the PhD pro program is, is is your project. It's your it's like your baby. You have to like uh, really nurture it. So early on in your project, um, you will want to have frequent meetings with your supervisor. Um, having said that, supervisors are a bit different. So um, Depend, some supervisors or principal investigators are also, you know, young achievers, um, and some of them are, are a bit uh, advanced in their careers. Uh, they have a few more years under their belt, so it depends whether you have like a young or old professors in quotes. Um, so early on, um, it is recognized, and even in most cases, your panel will understand that coming from you know a different background or a different setting they will give you a lot of support so in in the first six months um you will have some key milestones or timelines so uh you'll have to submit uh for instance your research proposal and you have to do like a confirmation process of candidature so that you continue in your program so um practically uh I think one one meeting in a fortnight or once every two weeks is reasonable for a PhD candidate in their first or second year. But when you get to like writing your thesis or in your last year, you could stay, you know, sometimes your supervisors just, you know, like let you go and you you're left to work on your project once your methods or once you're thesis is taking shape and, you know, they will meet you less frequently, uh, you know, once a month or, you know, a couple of times in a semester. So uh, it depends on the, on your level of competence and your level of familiarity within your research topic. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, anyone else with a question for Shadra? Yeah, feel free also to to write me an email um, or uh, you know via LinkedIn or or shoot me a question up on Twitter. I'm happy to take um, specific questions. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you guys. Um, Shadra, do you have like one? Parting short, one last parting short. Uh, keep going. Science is not always easy. I myself am also learning in the process. So um, uh, do the most that you can uh, each day uh, and try and, and do your works in bits and pieces. And in the long run, you will have achieved um, your project or research question. So, so keep ticking away um, and, and don't give up. Yeah, it's it's a it can be quite a tedious journey, uh, but you keep going. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Shidrak. Um, that's it for today, guys. Uh, see you next time. Bye, Shidrak. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Sorry I went over the time. Pleasure meeting oh, you all. No, Cheers. No worries. No worries. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.